You're listening to the Clear Creek Resources Podcast from Clear Creek Community Church. To hear more, check out clearcreekresources.org. All right, well, welcome back to the Clear Creek Resources Podcast. My name is Tiffany Havaducci, and I am your host for today. I am very excited to have a conversation today with Jenna Kraft. Uh, Jenna is part of our women's teaching team here at Clear Creek. She serves students at the 528 campus. Is That's that right? That's right, yes. Awesome. <laughs> and teaching pastor Yancey Arrington. We know you. We love you. Welcome back Thank to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be back. Thanks, Tiffany. Awesome. So we are having just a podcast series called A Closer Look where we're going to kind of dive in a little bit deeper to some of the doctrines that are coming up in the text that we're studying all together corporately. And right now we're in 2 Peter. Um, And so today we're going to have a conversation about the resurrection. What is that? What do we believe about that? Um, And so there is a survey that comes out every two years called the State of Theology. It fascinates me. I read it every time it comes (laughs) out. Um, And so one of the things that was in that survey is that 66% of evangelicals believe Um, the Bible's account of the resurrection of Jesus, right? However, if you look a little closer at some of the other questions, it seems as if there's a little bit of a disconnect between what that means in our life, right? So like a growing number also believe that God is unconcerned with their daily lives. There's some question about the validity of scripture. And so these two answers to these survey questions sort of contradict each other a little bit. Mm. So let's talk today about the resurrection, what that doctrine is, and then does it mean anything for our daily lives? So let's start big. Let's start at the top. Um, What is this doctrine of resurrection um, about? We sing songs about Jesus uh, dying and raising, and all of this seems to be a really big deal to the Christian church. And so what is the content of this doctrine? What do we believe about it? Yeah, so um, Christianity uh, in its orthodox uh, state would say that uh, we believe that Jesus Christ, uh, and if it's kind of the old Apostles' Creed or Nicene Creed, you know, suffered under Pontius Pilate. He died on the cross, and on the third day he rose from the dead. And so that's just a simplification or a summary of what we see in the biblical account uh, in the life and times of Jesus. And so the doctrine of the resurrection is that we believe as followers of Jesus, uh, that Jesus Christ not only suffered on the cross and died on the cross, that he was truly buried and was dead. And then three days later, uh, came alive again uh, and was resurrected, came back to life. Uh, that the, the nuance of that is he came to a new life. It was still Jesus, uh, but what we talk about resurrection life. And so I'm sure we'll get into the details of this later on, but that's, mm-hmm. that's, the, that's the simple uh, first part of that, uh, then, then in addition to that, we believe that uh, really everyone will be raised at some point bodily where mm-hmm. their spirits join their bodies at the end of the age, and that's known as judgment day or the day of the Lord where it all happens. At least I, I hold that it all happens at one time, I should say, and uh, some will go be with Christ in uh, eternal life known as the new heavens and the new earth, the new cosmos, and others uh, to eternal perdition. Uh, away from God's blessed presence. And so uh, that, that in a nutshell is the doctrine of the resurrection, not just of Jesus, mm-hmm. uh, but, of, uh, but of humanity in the, in the last day. But it's all, it, all, it all kicks off, if you will. The domino that first falls is the resurrection of Jesus, the first fruits of the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we, so, I mean, like you said, the, the most basic <laughs> fundamental belief is that we, we believe that Jesus really physically died and he really physically came back to life. So this this belief in a bodily resurrection, I think, is at the heart of the gospel of the Christian faith. But I think it's also okay for us to to just kind of take some extra time to scrutinize this claim. Because it is, it's a very unique claim. <laughs> yeah. Like, do we really believe, do we really believe that somebody really died and really came back to life? And I think the the statistics that you gave, they don't even surprise me. And Mm -hmm. Honestly, I even would count myself among the people that have have asked those questions. Like, do we really believe that this is true? Mm -hmm. Because if, I mean, statistics say there's about 2.4 billion Christians all over the world. So 2.4 billion people are basing their lives off of a poor peasant that lived in an obscure town of Nazareth that lived 2,000-ish years ago. Like we're basing our lives off of these claims. And so I think it is important that that we do approach this with with extra scrutiny. Do we look at the the historical evidence? Is it just a spiritual reality that that helps mm-hmm. us make sense of the world mm-hmm. that we live in? 
Or is this a historical event that we can base our lives on? It's mm-hmm. an important claim, and it's not something we just talk about at Easter once a year. <laughs> yeah. It really does impact every day yep. of our lives. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up. So if this is a claim that we're going to base our life off of, which is a big deal, right? Like if we just stop there, that's already a really big right. deal. Um, so if this is something that we're going to base our lives off of, what is the evidence? Is there biblical evidence of this doctrine? And then also, is there any evidence outside of the Bible, historical evidence of the resurrection? What what kind of uh, clues can we look to to tell us if this is a valid thing? So let's let's scrutinize it a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, Paul even says, if it's not true, we're all wasting our time, right? right. If, it, right. if this is not right. true, <clears throat> if yes. Jesus really didn't rise from the dead, it, we're all wasting our time. But yeah. if it is true, then it changes everything. Yeah. Yes. And so I think it's very important for us to engage our minds and to actually take a look at, at what is the historical evidence for this claim that we're making. So for me, it actually helps to go back and look at the historical context of, mm-hmm. of all of this, of the life of Jesus, of the death, of his resurrection, because it didn't happen in a historical vacuum. He wasn't somebody that just showed up one day and claimed to, right. to die and come back to life. Um, and really, history is, is a friend of Christianity. Mm-hmm. We love history. We love the, the archaeology. We, we love to dig in and, and to explore these claims that we're making. And so some of the historical context of this is um, the Jews have been, they were exiled. They were taken out of the land. Um, they were able to then return to the land. You can, I mean, look at world history and just see this back and forth of these, these foreign oppressive powers that are overtaking the Jewish people. And so, so right now the Jewish people are back in the land, but they are still under the oppression mm-hmm. of, of now Rome. Mm-hmm. And so the Jewish people, they have this, this expectation that when the Messiah comes, they will overthrow their oppressors and restore the kingdom of Israel, just like when David was ruling as king, mm-hmm. right? So there's, there's this expectation of the Messiah coming. And so Jesus wasn't the first person on the scene to, be, to make claims of being Messiah. Correct. Even in the, the hundred years leading up to Jesus, there were at least 10 other people that are making that claim of being the Messiah, the, the mm-hmm. one that is going to come and, and restore the kingdom back to Israel. Mm-hmm. And so what would happen is these other Messiahs, they would, they would rise up and they would, they would get their following. They would gather these people they would make their case and and then they would be killed by Rome or right. by someone and then the movement would be over mm-hmm. or sometimes maybe the brother would take over and they would try to carry on this movement but ultimately the the movements were squashed and then that was it and mm-hmm. so there there was this expectation of where is the messiah where is the one who is going to come and and make all things right and so so then when Jesus comes onto the scene and he's making these claims of being the messiah there was this excitement again of of being liberated from these roman oppressors mm-hmm. um, but when Jesus uh, lives his life. He has his earthly ministry. And then when he is arrested, all of his followers, they just flee. They all leave him. They abandon him, mm-hmm. right? Peter, one of his closest disciples, denies him three times, mm-hmm. right? They're, they're like, okay, it's over. It's all, it's all done. And then we see in Luke 24, um, this this story of the road to Emmaus, where Jesus meets up with two of his followers and 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 they tell them like, well, we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one that was mm-hmm. going to redeem Israel. So, so we see there is this Jewish expectation of a Messiah who was going to come, that was going to save the people of Israel. Mm-hmm. And they thought that Jesus was going to be this Messiah. Um, but when he was defeated, they thought that the movement was over. But then the people on the road, the, the two on the road to Emmaus, they say, but some of our women amazed us. Mm. <laughs> they say they went to the tomb and they didn't find his body. Yeah. And so what's interesting to me, what is so convincing to me is, is there was no expectation of resurrection, mm-hmm. right? So in the, the Greek view, there is the immortality of the soul, but not of the body. In the Jewish expectation, like Yancy had said, there was, there was an expectation of this general resurrection on the last day, but there was no expectation that the Messiah would resurrect and rise again. And so they go to the tomb and there's no body right? The angel says, he's not here. He is risen. Not just that he's alive, he is 
risen. Mm -hmm. He was dead mm -hmm. and he came back to life. And so then we kind of see the story spreading from there. Um, but really what is very convincing to me, some evidence that is very convincing to me is there was no expectation of a resurrection, but this event that really did happen, it changed the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you had mentioned before in the pre pre conversation we had before the mm -hmm. podcast, <clears throat> that the, the Jews did have an expectation of resurrection with the story of Jesus and Lazarus. Mm -hmm. What were you highlighting in that? Yeah, I was just saying, so uh, Jesus had, this is, the, this is the Tiffany translation. Sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Jesus had these uh, friends that were siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Lazarus uh, dies, and Jesus takes his time getting there, right? And when he alludes to Martha that he's going to be raised again, Martha's like, yeah, of course, on the last day, right? Yeah. right. They were expecting this resurrection to come at the end of time. Um, however, that's not exactly how it played out. So I think the unexpected part is that this resurrection is yeah. happening sort of in the middle of the story, mm -hmm. right? There's even in, the, um, in Daniel 12, same sort of thing, right? There's this um, idea of resurrection mm -hmm. um, at the end mm -hmm. of yeah. the age. And so... Yeah, things things went a little bit differently than expected. Well, just mm -hmm. just the fact that Jenna takes time to to walk us through really beautifully the expectation theologically for the Jews of Jesus day was they weren't anti-resurrection. Mm -hmm. They were anti-resurrection on any day but judgment day. Right. So, you know, even we have Mary and Martha going, you know, we know Jesus, uh, we know Lazarus is going to get resurrected. He's a righteous man, he's of Israel. We'll just see him on the last day and then Jesus just drops that incredible line you know, I am the resurrection mm -hmm. and the life, mm -hmm. you know, he, so uh, the fact that Jesus does something earlier than everyone else expects, that really was the curveball. And, mm -hmm. but when you, you think about like, what's the historical evidence for it? Mm -hmm. So there, there, there are, there are non-Christian writings like Josephus, mm -hmm. uh, Tacitus that mention uh, the death of Jesus, at least the death of Jesus. And mm -hmm. so uh, I don't, I don't think that there is any scholar out there that said uh, that Jesus did not die. They all believe that Yeshua or Yeshua of, of Israel of Nazareth uh, was uh, some some Jewish uh, teacher slash rabbi that was convicted by the Romans uh, and was crucified and executed. I like that Jenna talks about that the first people that see Jesus, or at least an empty tomb, not see Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, although they do later, but see an empty tomb are two women. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, as N.T. Wright points out, scholar N.T. Wright, whose book, uh, The Resurrection of the Son of God, is probably the, what you would say in, a, in an academic term, the, the classicus textus of a good apologetic and defense of the resurrection of Jesus. It says it was amazing because uh, in that day and age, women weren't even legitimate, they weren't considered legitimate witnesses. Right. And so, you know, if you're writing the Bible, you know, well, if you're making up a story, if you're making yeah, up a story, right. like, you, wanna... you don't want to have women right. there. So it's right. it's Tiffany and Jenna uh, get to, if we're if we're, it's two thousand years ago, we're all Jews here. We're writing up the Bible here because we want to make Jesus look good. And Tiffany and Jenna, uh, we think, hey, let's just put ourselves as the witnesses. I'd be like, no, we can't do that because mm -hmm. no one, right. They don't have a, they don't have any witness or legal authority. Take that out. Take yeah, that take out. that out. Yeah. The fact that it's in, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Knowing that it doesn't help their cause right. uh, if they're trying to pull the wool over someone's eyes, right. mm -hmm. but it does help their cause if they're trying. And it, it actually adds to the legitimacy of the account, right. because no one would 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 do that. Um, in fact, uh, I, I I think you look at uh, the things I have noted here, and and to be fair, let me give good attribution. Uh, Shil uh, Neil Shevney, who is a PhD research scientist out of Yale, uh, compiled just a lot of different. Uh, scholarly articles about the evidence historically for the resurrection of Jesus from different scholars and theologians, and, mm -hmm. and not necessarily Christians, by the mm -hmm. way, but even mm -hmm. Jewish ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I'll read you one quote by a Jewish New Testament scholar, Geza Vermes. He says, uh, he concludes, quote, in the end, when every argument has been considered and weighed, the only conclusion acceptable to the historian must be that the opinions of the Orthodox the liberal sympathizer, and even the critical agnostic alike, and even perhaps of the disciples themselves, are simple interpretations of the one disconcerting fact, which is, namely that the women who set out to pay their last respects to Jesus found to their consternation, not a body, but an empty tomb. Now, the fact that it's empty, some, some, someone, some people would say like, okay, we get that he died, but why is it that he's empty such a big deal? Because mm -hmm. uh, when you understand historically, uh, as, as Jenna so well put out, there were a lot of different people claiming to be the Messiah. Mm -hmm. They all die. Mm -hmm. They may have a brother picks up, then they die. Mm -hmm. 
And because the, Jerusalem's a tinderbox right now, there's a lot of people wanting Jerusalem to be free from their oppressive Romans. So the Romans will do anything it takes mm -hmm. to keep all those tensions down, ironically, mm -hmm. as we talk here now with yeah. tensions in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> here we have... Um, their best interest is for that tomb to stay sealed and for that body to be there, right? Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so the fact that the tomb is empty is problematic. If you're, if you're a skeptic that doesn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, what are you doing when the tomb's at least empty? Because uh, we saw the kind of uh, kinetic work that it exploded out of that with the birth of Christianity. Mm -hmm. All they had to do is produce the body. It's all they had to do, right. show the body. Mm -hmm. You know, it, It's still definitely going to be there after three days, uh, after three weeks. You're, you're going to have bones and t you'll have all kinds of... They, they never produced it. Uh, and that's all they had to do to stop yeah. what, what was being started there. So I, mm -hmm. I think that's powerful. Well, and even, I mean, the Romans were professional executioners. Absolutely. Yes. Right? This was, Absolutely. this was a tool of propaganda <clears throat> for them that, you know, as they're dominating all these foreign lands, they use the cross to say, if you want to oppose Rome, this is that's all right. that's left for you. That's right. 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 They were professional in the sense it was literally their job mm -hmm. to kill whoever was on the cross. And so, I mean, there were theories that, uh, maybe he didn't really die, right? Yeah. He, you know, just kind of passed out and it was really severe. But Known as the swoon theory. The swoon theory, right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if if Jesus was in that state where uh, he had just kind of passed out in the tomb, um, the the all the abuse that he took before, the torture that he went before, I mean, these again, these Romans are professional executioners. That spear in his side surely would, really would have messed <laughs> right, him up. Right, they would not have let him leave the cross right. still alive. Yeah. And if, mm -hmm. if he was, if he was in that state, how would he have rolled the stone back, been able to escape, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it is interesting to engage some of these theories because the reality of the evidence is that, okay, something happened, Yes, mm -hmm. right? Like you Absolutely. said, there was no body. There was no they body. Went, there was no body. If there was a body, the body would have been produced. You know, they would have say, well, here it is. You know, he really didn't die. So, so something happened. Also, as this the the genesis of Christianity, something happened to take these trembling Jewish disciples mm -hmm. who were not excited. They weren't like, "All right, Jesus died. Now he's about to come back to That's life." Right. Right? right? They didn't have this expectation. They thought it was all over. So to take these trembling Jewish disciples who were afraid and locked inside of this room, Peter went back to fishing. the The two on the road to Emmaus, they were just probably going home. Something happened that changed everything for yeah. them. And so what, ha so that's, I mean, I think that's, that's what demands an answer and, and that we have to think about, we have to consider historically. Yeah. Okay, here's the evidence. What could have happened? Was there, was there um, that he didn't really die, the swoon theory? Was it that the disciples stole the body? Yeah. Uh, was, was there Greek? It, did they hallucinate? Was there hallucination? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it all just mystical that... Um, yeah that they just kind of came up with these great moral stories to tell mm -hmm. later on. Um, Cause it's, it's a really good story to tell about um, self-sacrifice for the sake of love. Yeah. yeah. Right. So there, there are, there, there are all these theories because again, something happened and how do we explain it? And part of the, part of the reason this answer just keeps getting, you know, longer and longer and longer because there really is just some really great evidence mm -hmm. that speaks against even just some of our rational think, like it would be a rational for these, you know, Jenna mentioned, um, you know, is it a swoon theory? Did Jesus just lose a lot of blood and, you know, they got him in the tomb, but somehow they, they, he got out of there. He slipped past the Roman attache that was there and uh, never to be seen again. Uh, was he, did the disciples, were they so distraught and traumatized that they just hallucinated Jesus? They kind of thought that they, or are they all speaking in a spiritual way? But when you actually read the accounts, uh, it says that Jesus, they could touch him, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they ate with him. Mm -hmm. And what, what's amazing to me is that this is just, you know, when you get to now like Acts 1 and 2 where Peter's preaching, the first sermon that he preaches is that, you know, that Jesus has been crucified, now he's resurrected. That's, that's seven weeks. Mm -hmm. What how, mm -hmm. After seven weeks from the crucifixion of them preaching, uh, they're, they're preaching that Jesus is alive at the very peril of their own lives. Mm -hmm. um, I mean... Not too shortly after that, the first martyr of the church is Stephen. Mm -hmm. He's getting killed because he believes that Jesus is alive. So it, it doesn't like help them to believe something that's false. They, 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 they either saw someone or something. Obviously, we believe someone, Jesus. Uh, actually, I would say it this way. The, the, only, the, the, the most compelling argument for why these men and women uh, put their literal lives 
out there, uh, and many of them died. 11 out of the 12 apostles, uh, reportedly, historically, with tradition, have, were martyred, mm-hmm. save John. I mean, to do that on a hoax, mm-hmm. I mean, it's one thing to be a part of a cult that says thousands or hundreds of years ago something happened you can't prove. These are people that knew Jesus, met with Jesus, and now are willing to die for Jesus. Peter gets, ex- we're on Peter, tradition holds Peter was executed upside down on a cross mm-hmm. because he didn't feel worthy enough to be executed in the same manner of Jesus. Like he must have seen something powerful to go, I'll die for this. And so um, all of that stuff to me is, is, is just incredibly, incredibly compelling. The conversion of Paul, I'll leave it mm-hmm. at this one. Mm-hmm. So here you have a guy, his job is to persecute Christians, mm-hmm. um, to put them in jail, to take their lives. He's actually at the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr. And he's, he's like, I'll hold, your, I'll hold the, your jacket so you can get a good throw of mm-hmm. rock on this guy's head. And so here we have someone who, um, who's on the road to Damascus. A lot of things happen when you're on the roads to places. Road to Emmaus, <laughs> Luke 24, uh, road yes. to Damascus. And um, he ha- sees the resurrected Jesus. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, in a, just a, a flip of a switch, he's now a Christian. He's... Um, He's, he's doing the exact opposite of what he intended to do at the peril of his own life. So now he's got to run around in dark places because instead of attacking people for Jesus and their belief in his resurrection, he's actually preaching about Jesus and his resurrection. Those things don't add up if they're hallucinations, if they're wishful thinking or you know this, that, or the other. So it's those kinds of things that we put together and we just think, I mean, let's just be rational about it. And I I love how you, it's a crazy claim. Mm -hmm. I mean, Christianity has crazy claims, right? This guy Mm -hmm. walks on water. He Mm -hmm. does all these miracles. And to top it all off, we think he rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. But it's not a, it's it's not blind faith. Absolutely. I mean, this is like what we want to tell Christians is like, this is a, I w- it's going to sound weird. This is an intelligent person's faith, yeah. Yeah. at least when it comes to this, because the the data is is so compelling that even skeptics uh, will say something incredible happened, mm-hmm. uh, and then to see the birth of Christianity and people just willing to die for it uh, within their own life of something that happened within their own lifetime that they could prove or not yes. uh, seems to seems to go with Jesus really did rise from the dead. Yeah, that's a great point, especially <clears> the <throat> the transformation of the disciples. I mean, speaking of Peter, he was so afraid uh, that he denied to a little girl mm-hmm. oh, for that, sure. that he mm-hmm. that he knew Jesus to someone who was willing to be martyred for yep. him, right? And and speaking of Paul, uh, he even gives evidence to the people who were still alive that could sort of back up his claim, right? right? right. If, don't take my word for it. Go ask the yeah. 500s who, who saw him. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and just, I know we can go to the next question. No, Let me just okay. end with this, uh, in, at least with this section. So uh, there's a guy, he's been on the news quite a bit, not recently, but over time, named uh, Reza uh, Aslan, which I always thinks an ironic last name. He's a he's a Muslim author, mm. and he argues that it's it's really quote unquote impossible to know mm. uh, what happened after Jesus' death. And yet, uh, mm-hmm. and he's not a Christian; he's a Muslim, but he recognizes the significance of everything that's happened as a as a story. And here's what he says, and I'll I'll just it just was powerful to me. He says one could simply discuss the resurrection as a lie and declare belief in the risen Jesus to be the product of a deludable mind. However, there is this nagging. This is this is a skeptic. I mean, this mm-hmm. is a non-believer. Mm-hmm. However, there is this nagging fact to consider. One after another of those who claim to have witnessed the risen Jesus went to their own gruesome deaths, refusing to recant their testimony. Mm-hmm. That is not in itself unusual. Many zealous Jews died horribly for, for for refusing to deny their beliefs. But these first followers of Jesus were not being asked to reject matters of faith based on events that took place centuries, if not millennia before. Mm. They were being asked to deny something they themselves personally, directly encountered. And that's something that Reza has a hard time getting over. Mm -hmm. And I I appreciate the integrity of that because it's like, well, you know, Christians aren't crazy Mm -hmm. to believe that the resurrection is real. And I would argue everything Christianity stands or falls on uh, depends on that tomb being empty and a real Jesus coming out of it. But Mm-hmm. That's a long answer. And if you want to add to it, go ahead. No, well, but, no, I mean, I mean, what I was just going to say is what I really appreciate about this conversation is that as Christians, we don't have to reject science or history. Correct. And I feel like we have honestly just scratched the surface For of sure. the historical <clears throat> evidence to validate the the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so I appreciate that, that, that we're encouraged to engage. We're encouraged mm-hmm. to ask these hard questions. Because again, if it's not true, we want to know that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. We don't want to base our lives off of a lie. And so 
it's not like, well, I guess we just have to believe that someone died and someone came back not to life. Not wishful thinking. Right. Mm-hmm. It is It is engage the hard questions. It's ask the hard questions. Examine the evidence. And so, again, I feel like we've just barely scratched the, sur- the surface. And so if you are, if anyone's interested, there's a ton of awesome resources out there. Um, but just to know that that this is a good thing to do as followers of Christ. Mm-hmm. And there is a lot of really wonderful and helpful historical evidence, not to answer every question mm-hmm. that we'll ever have, right. but really good, helpful answers to some hard questions. Mm-hmm. So much evidence, so much material that it takes this long to answer that question. Mm-hmm. And that's the short answer. Yeah, I mean, right. I recommended yeah. N.T. Wright's The Resurrection mm-hmm. and the Son of God. I, I read through most of it. It's this thick. Mm-hmm. And there are... Tons of books like that. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. uh, I, frankly, that's probably the appropriate amount of weight to give it at mm-hmm. time on a question like that. It may be the biggest question we ask today. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. agreed. Yeah. So this is a a specifically Christian belief, right? So, um, how necessary is it that we hold this? So, sort of Clear Creek language, we have closed handed issues and yeah. open handed issues, right? When it comes to certain theological beliefs, some of them we're not willing to budge on, they're non-negotiable. And some of them we can hold with an open hand, we can sort of have a difference of opinion, we can all do this church community life together. So what kind of doctrine is this? Is this essential? Is this open-handed? Can I just believe that Jesus was a great teacher? Do I have to believe that he, um, maybe I can even believe that he died for me, but do I have to believe that he resurrected bodily? Mm. What kind of issue is this, would you say? Well, I'll jump on it only because I, I know Jenny even mentioned earlier that the reference in Corinthians that if we if we don't believe this, we're to be pitied among all people. But mm-hmm. First Corinthians uh, fifteen, yes, First Corinthians that. fifteen, <laughs> um, and we can reference that for sure. I mean, G, Paul himself knows the gospel well enough to know that this is the thread that unravels everything if yes. you pull it. And so, with that said, you're right. We talk about open-handed beliefs uh, that. Uh, we're not going to be overly dogmatic about it, that we may believe deeply, but not so much where we'd say like, you're not a Christian if you don't believe this. Like mm-hmm. how we how we do our baptism. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're convinced uh, about about the end times or something to that effect. Like this is what I believe about it, but you know, uh, but but like the atonement, like Jesus dying on a cross, that's a close-handed issue. We're not going to let that up because to, to let it go almost seems to let go of the faith itself. Well, the resurrection of Jesus, excuse me, is exactly one of the uh, close-handed issues. And so I, I think it's important, and I just was trying to list like, what off the top of my head, if the resurrection did not happen, what 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 doctrines would that affect? And I'm not too sure it doesn't affect every one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but That's a good way to think the, about the it. things that off the top of my head, I mean, even creation for that matter, mm-hmm. the, the renewal mm-hmm. of it all. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, I think about the divinity of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, the way Jesus resurrects, and it says that he resurrects himself, it also says the Father resurrects him, says the Spirit, so the whole Trinity is involved here. Um, but Jesus' claims to who he was get validated at the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Not at the crucifixion, right. but at the resurrection. So like every, I always like to tell people, the reason, uh, listen, if you can find someone who says they're going to die and then gets resurrected later on, believe everything they ever say. Because mm-hmm. Jesus says all these things that people think are so wild, but maybe his craziest claim is, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise in three days. Mm-hmm. Once he pulls that off, to say, to say it in that frame, uh, everything else he says is true. So whatever he says about the kingdom of God, whatever he says about truth, whatever he says about justice, whatever he says about mercy. So to me, uh, the resurrection uh, authenticates everything, or validates everything Jesus says. Jesus needs no validation. He's Jesus. <laughs> but, the, the, but it does show that he comes in power, shows his power. It denies, uh, to deny the resurrection, I would argue, denies the new heaven and the new earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, you know, it, it denies the return of Jesus in a way that's real. It denies our union with Christ. It mm-hmm. denies uh, the work of salvation. I mean, I, 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 salvation's held in the balance. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to have the God-man die for us, and yet he has to rise from death to show his victory over sin, death, and hell. So, uh, I mean, I, I really do think almost every, I would think every doctrine at some point has a crossroad and intersection with a resurrection of Jesus. So those are a few that I think for sure I can draw straight lines mm-hmm. to. Well, and the only thing I want to add to that is I think there's a reason why we took so much time kind of painting the historical context, the biblical evidence for this, because I think that the the writers of the Gospels, the early Christians, are making a claim for a real bodily resurrection of Jesus. Mm-hmm. They're not making a claim that this is a spiritual idea. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we're going to take serious the the point that the biblical authors are trying to make, um, if we're going to take serious the claims of the Bible— 
they are claiming for a real bodily resurrection mm -hmm. and, and how that changed everything. So I would agree. I think it's, it's the heart of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I agree. And not only did, does it uh, fulfill Jesus' own words, he, he, he prophesied this was going to happen, but also centuries and centuries past, right? Sure. So it's validated in the Bible. It's validated outside of the Bible. Very good. So how then does this doctrine affect my faith, right? So sort of thinking back to that poll, okay, we, let's say we agree that the resurrection happened as the Bible spelled it out. But then what does that mean for me today? How does that affect my life? Because there's so many crossroads with so many other sure. doctrines, it, it does sort of like spider web out, right? It affects sort of lots of things. But let's, let's talk about some of those ways that it, that it impacts our daily life. So um, John Dixon has a book called uh, Bullies and Saints, and he talks about um, the good and the bad, like the highs and the lows uh, throughout church history. And he has this line that has just kind of stuck with me uh, when he talks about the early church. He calls them cheerful losers. Mm. Mm. He says that they line. were, they were cheerful line. losers because they knew that they had already won, mm. that there's just a certain certainty, security, uh, peace, mm -hmm. uh, settled joy mm -hmm. that comes when you know that you are connected to a risen Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it made me also just think of what Paul says in Romans 8, 34 through 39. I mean, the, the, the resurrection is all throughout, not just the gospels, but the early writings of the yes. Christians. Mm -hmm. and, and Paul says in Romans 8, 34 through 39, he says, Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that was raised. So it's not just that he died, but he right. was raised, right? He says, who's at the right hand of God who is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so I just think it's this picture that, I mean, no matter how devastating our struggles, and it's not to minimize the hard things that, that they were going through, that yeah. the early church mm -hmm. was going through, or that we are going through today, it's not to minimize any right. of those things, but it is a reminder that they are temporary. And when we can view them from an eternal perspective, that, that you are loved by a risen Christ, that I think it just changes our perspective on, on everything. It is, it is our identity that we are new creation, yeah. and it is the power for us to live in, in the mess of this world, right? That we are united to a living Christ. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I'm, I totally agree. And um, <clears throat> I, as you said, it doesn't mean there aren't hard times in the world. In, in fact, it empowers us through those hard times. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what stands out to me about how does this affect my faith, and I'm sure... As you noted, those those intersections are everywhere. But where I find it most in me is where I, I do see the brokenness of the world or in my own world where uh, suffering seems to be at its zenith and pain at its apex. I'm just reminded, uh, not that this world is not my home, as the popular hymn once says, mm -hmm. uh, but more that God's coming to make all things new. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I get a snapshot of that in the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, uh, it's said of Jesus, he's the firstborn of uh, the firstborn of the resurrection, firstborn of the new creation. Um, he's the first fruits, I should say. And and if that's the picture, here we have a, a resurrected Jesus who who looks like Jesus, uh, talks like Jesus, but he's he's different. Uh, in other words, he's been built now. As a human being, he's now uh, built for the kingdom of God in its fullness mm -hmm. to know that um, so much so that he sends right to heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, you know, the place of power. To know that that, that is, if, if, if I can use this language, uh, that is our older brother who goes before us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's powerful uh, to, to think about. Um, it buoys the heart mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're really at a low place going, you know, things can get bad. But they get, get so bad that they eclipse this wonderful truth that mm -hmm. um, he's Jesus' resurrection is the shot across the bow that says, uh, I'm coming to make all things new. And for those who believe upon me, as he says back to the, the scene with Lazarus' his family, uh, do you believe I am the resurrection and the life? Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, 
that's for me is one place mm-hmm. where Jesus's resurrection is where the, how the rubber of Jesus's resurrection meets the road in my own heart to know like, you know what, uh, as Jesus has gone, so will one day I go. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so will we all uh, in this way where we get, uh, you know, we get beat up in our sanctification. Uh, it goes and fits and starts, but one day we'll be glorified as he is. And in, in, a, in a realm that is so wonderful, Paul can't even tell you about it because he gets caught up in a vision of heaven. He's like, it's too good. I can't tell you because mm-hmm. you'd want to leave. And, and so amazing that John the Revelator can only speak about it in symbols and signs. Mm-hmm. It's that, you know, and all we get at the very end is uh, there's no tears, you know, sadness no more, uh, and all these, ama- no more chaos. Uh, and yet uh, the one who is there is, is the bodily resurrected King Jesus. So, mm-hmm. man, I, you talk about this forever, but for me, that, that, that's how that doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus, I mean, that's one major way it does it. And, and really the second one is whenever I have doubts, and I have doubts whenever I, I think most people do, whenever I have, I have doubts about, gosh, is this, Lord, is this all real? I mean, I, sometimes I have my heart wavers. I always go back to an empty tomb and resurrected Jesus. I'm mm-hmm. like, that happened. Mm-hmm. That happened. And um, you know what, guys? You know, people ask me questions in systematic theology or something that are hard to answer. You know, what about pain in the world? And why does God do all that? I don't know. All I know is, is ultimately <laughs> Jesus came out of that tomb. And uh, so whatever he says must be true, and he must be good, and he must be God. And that's why the resurrection is so powerful for me, uh, at least in my life at this point. Those are some of the touch points with my own heart and journey uh, with with how that adopt- how that doctrine affects my faith. Well, and I think even just like new creation is something we get to experience <clears throat> now. Mm-hmm. It's not just something that we are waiting for to experience mm-hmm. someday, but mm-hmm. we are new creation and we get to bring new creation to the world. And I love what Paul says in Philippians 3.10, where he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, mm-hmm. the fellowship or the the participation of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow to attain the resurrection of the dead, that it's, he says, I want to know Christ. And he talks about that resurrection power, but it's, I want to participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so it's this picture of, of following the one who, who led the way in his self-giving love, that he didn't come to earth to, to just destroy and to dominate and yeah. to overpower his enemies, but he came to die for them. Mm-hmm. And I get to imitate Jesus as I follow him to the cross in his self-giving love. And and in that, I am united with him in his death and I am united with him in his life. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I see Paul just, just grasping onto that. I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection the fellowship of sharing in that suffering. And then, and then he says to somehow attain, it's like this, this wonderful, glorious reality that I get to experience new life and new creation now. So this is who I am and this is what I do, yeah. right? I mm-hmm. spread new creation. I follow the, the giver of life, the giver of love, the giver of peace. This is who I follow. That's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spread this throughout the whole world. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, so good. I even think of um, like Romans 4, right? When Paul's mm. talking, he's like, the, the resurrection is our justification, mm. right? Like mm. it, it's the thing that we can look back to and go like, okay, Jesus laying down his life to pay for our sin, mm. it was successful. Mm. Because he rose, we know that he conquered death, right? So like you were saying, of all the things that we don't know, <laughs> right, right, right. the one thing that we can always hold to is that this this took, right? So that's super helpful. And also not only that, but without the resurrection, we don't have the Holy Spirit and the mm-hmm. Holy Spirit empowers mm-hmm. us for sanctification, for growth. So, so, so much, really, it I is. Know, the there's, one... there's just so much to say. There's so much yes. more I feel like we could have said on all of these. So I would just encourage anyone yes. who's listening, let this be like a, an itch, you know, like an itch for you, a hunger for you to go and learn more and explore more about this because mm-hmm. there's a wealth of, of things that you can explore and learn that we will never reach the bottom of. But I hope this will just get people excited about engaging this doctrine and learning more about this. Yep, I agree. I love it. We're all thankful that Jesus rose, right? Amen. <laughs> thankful. A, this is the best news we've ever heard. Anything else you guys want to end with before we wrap up? No, I think it's it's been great. I, I appreciate that. I, I maybe good for when people hear us uh, preach and teach, whether that's at um, you know on Sunday mornings or at a women's retreat or in our small groups. When we talk about the gospel and we talk about the power of the cross, 
Uh, the cross is kind of uh, a word that, that's all encapsulating mm-hmm. of the gospel. So when we talk about the cross, we don't just mean the death of Jesus. Mm-hmm. We actually have bookended the resurrection of that as well. So, and, and I think that's what the writers of the Bible do quite often. Because some people say, I mean, you guys talk a lot about the cross, but what about Jesus' resurrection? Well, for us, it's all the same thing. Mm-hmm. And so it just becomes kind of the touchstone when we say the cross. We mean who Jesus is and what he's done. And I would even argue that also includes his return, which is a whole nother topic mm. for a whole nother yep. day. But uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm grateful, like, you know, the... Uh, like the tombstones of old would simply say, awaiting the resurrection. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that that's that's where we're at now. Mm. Amazing. We have a living hope, and I'm happy for it. Yeah. So yeah. thank you both so much for the time that you took to have this conversation with us. Um, and thank you for all the resources that you mentioned. Those are all good places for listeners to kind of maybe jump in a little bit deeper. And um, yeah, like you said, just... Scratch the itch. Get into it. You're so good. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Tiffany. Yep, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Hey, thanks for checking out this video. If you haven't yet, make sure that you hit subscribe down below and check out clearcreekresources.org. We have videos, books, and sermons on there, as well as our audio podcast. Thanks for watching.